Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. 1M by 1M, as you know, is the first and only global virtual accelerator in the world for tech startups. We run it out of Silicon Valley, but with a global footprint, and our mission is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue. In support of the mission, this is these roundtables that we do, the men, free mentoring sessions, have been going on for over 10 years. This is the 423rd session. We've had over 100,000 people attend these. The event is being recorded. If you go to our YouTube channel, that's 1M1M Roundtables, you will find recordings of every single prior session over there. And um, this session will also go on there. There's also other video content that you'd find interesting. It's a very interesting and useful body of learning material. Um, on Twitter, we are at 1M by 1M and at Stromana, and we publish a lot of in interesting content, inspirational, educational, informative content. So again, another very good learning channel. Uh, if you're live tweeting today, please use hashtag 1M1M. These are the call-in instructions. We are in a round table. It is not a broadcast. We want to hear from you. We want you to participate as much as you want. The public chat is open. You can, um, you, you can dialogue through the public chat throughout the session. Just make sure you set your chat to send to all participants. Then everybody can see what you're saying, what you're thinking, etc. Um, and then later on in the program, after I've uh, finished both uh, the discussion with Krishna and then the investor pitches, I mean the entrepreneur pitches, I will turn uh, the call-in uh, opportunity on and you can call in and dialogue as well. So we start today with a conversation with Krishna Srinivasan, founding general partner of Live Oak Venture Partners. Welcome, Krishna. It's great to have you on the show. Great to be here. So, Krishna, let's first get our audience acquainted with yourself as well as with Live Oak. Tell us about the fund. Tell us about, a bit about your background. What do you like to invest in, and, and how do you think about uh, your portfolio? Absolutely. Um, my let me start with my background. I uh, grew up in India, uh, undergraduate degree from one of the IITs, and then uh, came to the United States to get a master's from the University of Texas in Austin, and then uh, worked in industry at Motorola in the mid-90s. And following that, went to business school at Wharton and uh, started in the venture industry uh, in, in the year 2000, right at the beginning of 2000, yeah. for, uh, at the NASDAQ 5000. Um, joined the industry at a firm called Austin Ventures, yeah. which uh, at the time, one of the um, uh, well-respected firms, which uh, here in Austin, uh, joined Austin Ventures and spent a decade there uh, learning the business and made partner uh, around the 2005 timeframe. And then uh, earlier part of this decade, came out of Austin Ventures with two of my colleagues from there and started Live Oak Venture Partners um, here in Austin. Um, and how so we big have, is Live Oak? What's the size of the fund? Um, so we are investing at about uh, the first fund was $105 million. Uh, the second fund, we are in the quiet period. We are uh, just wrapping up in the final stages of wrapping up the fund. So we are not allowed to disclose the exact size of the fund at this time. Okay. Uh, but safe to say it's something comparable to uh, Live, yeah. Live Oak uh, fund, one, the fund one fund size. And talk a little bit about what you like to invest in. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we talk, we, we segment our investing strategy can be summarized in four buckets. First, we are, um, as, as a traditional early stage investor, um, as you know, early stage investing ends up being much more of a local neighborhood sport. So with that as context, our investing strategy, uh, we can talk about them in terms of uh, four buckets. Number one, um, our companies are predominantly headquartered in the state of Texas, close to us. Number two, uh, they're all in uh, 
technology and tech enabled services. Mm -hmm. For these companies, um, third element of our strategy is we are first institutional money uh, uh, in, in these companies. They might have raised some seed rounds before, friends and family rounds before, uh, or we might be the seed investor too, but we have first institutional money for these companies. First check could be as little as half a million dollars to as much as $4 million. More mm -hmm. typically, it's between one and a half and three for the first check. And then mm -hmm. we invest the whole life cycle of the company up to $10 million of the life of the company. And the fourth element of strategy is all these investments, we typically take board seats in them and we play the role of local lead investor, lead board members in the companies that we invest. And when you, can you double click down on stage? Uh, you know, early stage has gone through an evolution since you got into the business in 2000, right? I was, you know, I raised money for my startups all through the 90s, you know, mid 90s till 2000. Um, and that was a different game. It was seed and, and series A. Nowadays we are looking at pre-seed, seed, post-seed, pre pre-series A, small series A, large series A, there's a whole, <laughs> <laughs> you know, whole segmentation that has gone on in, in uh, just in seed. How do you uh, how do you fit in that spectrum of segmentation? See, the, um, the it not only has that evolved from a time dimension, it has evolved from a geography dimension. You know, Silicon yes. Valley is its own planet where these things have a different connotation as to what it is seed versus pre-seed, et cetera. Uh, so for the rest of the world, for the rest of the normal world here, uh, which often is very much part of that, uh, you know, activity is in general exploding. We can talk about the local market later. Um, for us, the typical companies we invest in, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to put them into a firm bucket. You know, for, let's say, a completely unproven, first-time entrepreneur, the typical stage we get in, they've got some level of early traction. Mm -hmm. uh, they might have, you know, 30, 40K of uh, monthly revenues, but some evidence of something about, some evidence of product market fit typically yeah. exists when we come into them, and we might call it a seed investment. It might be a one and a half to $2 million investment at the time. Uh, mm -hmm. In other instances, there is, a, let's say, a successful repeat entrepreneur who is coming in with a simply an idea where we might even be part of company formation with them. In those mm -hmm. instances, we might take even earlier stage risk and, uh, you know, help in the company formation itself. But that might even be a 2 to $3 million investment in that, into, into that company because that uh, individual has got such an incredible track record of uh, success and execution. Yeah. Um, so it's it's more a function of um, when we typically invest our one and a half to three million dollars, how do we feel about the company's ability to absorb that capital and do something meaningful with it, or are we still in the stage of trying to um, figure out what product, what market it needs to be? You're more forgiving, and you somehow believe that somebody who's been there, done that, can uh, absorb the capital sure. and do something effective with it. Uh, and so for us, we are, you know, I, I would say comparable to Silicon Valley, we are, I would say we are a seed investor, uh, but yeah. some of our companies could be called Series A or seeds when we make our investments in them. And, and it's interesting what you're pointing out about repeat entrepreneurs versus first-time entrepreneurs. Uh, the vast majority of our community, of course, is first-time entrepreneurs. Um, and, and I always say this, that if you are a repeat entrepreneur with track record, you can get away with a lot. You can do a fat startup with somebody writing you a check. There are lots right. of options, lots of permutations and combinations. But as a first-time entrepreneur, none of those doors are open for you. So you're going to have to do it the hard way. You have to do it the, you know, you have to bootstrap to product market fit of some level and and right. and so on and so forth. So absolutely. You're, what you're saying is absolutely what we see as well. Now, um, what about B two B, B two C? Is there? Are you doing both? One? It's obviously you're doing B two B since you mentioned SaaS. Right. So you know, being um, geographically focused, we end up being somewhat more 
segment agnostic, uh, in, uh, but, but very geographically specific is what we do. So the companies we end up investing in are companies where there ends up being world-class talent available in this market. And the talent here in this market ends up being, you know, uh, well, it's pretty broad, but the concentration of world-class talent here ends up being either in infrastructure software, there's a long history of innovation going back to when Tivoli got started here and IBM became IBM's uh, software business. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of amazing infrastructure software companies here in town, or there's a lot of uh, vertically oriented or industry specific software and technology enabled services. Uh, it's mm -hmm. huge just because Texas has got, you know, 50 plus uh, Fortune 500 headquartered companies. So there's a tremendous number of uh, industries here that have uh, historically underinvested in talent in these company, in technology in these places. So we end up coming across a lot of vertically oriented um, software or vertically oriented tech enabled services here. So mm -hmm. that ends up being the bulk of activity that we end up, uh, and, 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 and bulk of companies we end up backing. And how is the geographical distribution within Texas? So between Austin and Dallas and San Antonio, El Paso, where, where is the, how, how do you see the companies coming out? Are, are they also coming out in other places than Austin and Dallas? Well, I would say Austin definitely is the strongest of the markets. Yeah. Um, it's one where uh, it's, it's a, you know, we, we especially you see a big surge of migration from California and other yes. parts of the country Indeed. to Austin these Indeed. days. Yeah. Um, and so we see it probably, I would say, two-thirds of the activity here in Austin. I would say Dallas and Houston are following that, and San Antonio is probably number four on the list in terms of mm -hmm. activity. Uh, but, but that's you know, about we it. definitely see activity all over the state, uh, at least in these four big metros. Okay. So um, talk to us about some of the highlights in your portfolio. And, and as you were telling us some of these stories, um, give us some insight into what was going on when you saw these companies first. What is it about them that attracted you? What we try to do is give our audience a bit of an insight into how you think about investments. Sure. You know, um, um, uh, so we've, we've got, uh, today we have uh, 23 investments in the fund, a couple of them are still seed states, I would say 21 companies which are Series A and beyond in the portfolio, so between fund one and fund two, we've done three investments in the, in the new fund so far. Um, and I would, the, the ones I would highlight to you at all fall in this category of something industry specific meets, mm -hmm. uh, meets technology. And interestingly, going back to the, some of the comments you made, those are in fact, uh, many of them have first time entrepreneurs. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and we are we are absolutely, I would say half the portfolio consists of first time entrepreneurs, but these first time entrepreneurs typically are leveraging their domain expertise in some form or fashion. Yeah. They come out of those industries, they have an acute understanding of the challenges and problems in those industries and are able to parlay that insight, pair up with, uh, they might have been technologists also themselves, or pair up with technology technologists in order to be able to go tackle those uh, gnarly problems. And so are able to get to product market fit earlier because they have an industry Rolodex. Uh, so that's yeah. a fairly common pattern across the portfolio. And so we've got companies in legal meat technology, we've got a Three companies in healthcare meets technology. We got a couple in uh, the real estate meets technology, etc. People again with uh, a keen understanding of uh, problems, emerging problems in those industries, and how do you go tackle uh, those emerging problems in a very capital efficient fashion by parlaying industry insight, industry road access to go do that. So I would definitely urge entrepreneurs who are embarking on something to go back to their strengths to be able to do that, and that's been a significant. Uh, correlation between uh, success and establishing rapid product market fit in the ones that we've invested in. Okay. Uh, I'm happy to give you at least an example. You know, to give you uh, uh, one example, uh, one of the most exciting companies still in the portfolio is a company called CS Disco. Uh, it's a company that makes software for e-discovery. Uh, it's the complex uh, problem of taking all the documents that come in and uh, uh, this is a mission critical platform in which corporations, law firms, their outsourced managed services all 
collaborate on this platform through the life cycle of a case. A uh, company was started by uh, the youngest ever graduate from Harvard Law. Uh, came out of Harvard Law at the age of 19 uh, with an undergrad in, uh, in a computer science from before. Um, practiced law, practiced as a litigator after teaching at Northwestern at 21. And then while practicing as a litigator, discovered how terrible the software stack was to be able to practice his trade. And uh, hired guys within his law firm, rewrote the software stack with, with numerous open source technology elements uh, using Amazon, you know, cloud infrastructure, and uh, was able to be, uh, again, leverage his domain deeply to build an incredible product that had stunning reception, even when he was in his law firm, he could sell the product to other people. So we, he came, reached out to us with the story, uh, Wicked Smart Guy, domain-led uh, product. Uh, we are very yeah. product-heavy in the way we do go about investing, uh, domain-rich in the way he's gone about it. Uh, and we, in fact, formed the company and spun it all out, and he left his law firm to be a founder, um, CEO of his business. And Disco has simply exploded. You know, today, uh, over 60 uh, AM law, 200 law firms use the product. Um, you know, we've got hundreds of major enterprises using it. Uh, it is today the leading cloud-based e-discovery platform uh, and uh, you know, on its way to being a really substantial company today. Uh, and, and, and I'm still on the board of the company, and it's, we've, got, we've got phenomenal expectations for that company coming out. And how did this uh, entrepreneur find you, or how did you find him? No, you know, again, it's the old uh, myth of this business, right, which is um, – you need uh, a strong recommendation to be able to get to a venture firm. He just cold emailed us with his uh, backstory, and we we read all our emails, I, I guess. And in fact, people can <laughs> reach out to us at plans at liveoakvp.com. Um, but uh, so he reached out to us, and it was a cold email that we jumped all over it and uh, brought him in, introduced him to a few law firms ourselves. Two of them became customers during diligence and we knew we were onto something special. So yeah. and I would tell entrepreneurs that uh, no proxy for, you know, getting, figuring out this, he was able to demonstrate he had some early product market fit. He could yeah. uh, hang his hat onto his uh, domain-infused product innovation, uh, and uh, he was, uh, he had all the many other great attributes. He was authentic, he was very self-actualized about what he knew, what he did not know. Um, and he had all the right traits of being an entrepreneur. We were the light at the back and build a great company on. You know, what you said about, um, you know, cold emails versus introductions, um, I actually think that entrepreneurs should be able to cold email VCs because it's, uh, especially if you've got something going already and if you have some traction, you should be able to basically contact whomever you think would be the best investor for your business, and, and those investors should look at it. So I think it's, your, your point is very well taken that those who are not accepting cold, uh, intro, cold emails are probably losing out on a, on a certain type of deal flow where, especially these kinds of people who have domain knowledge, somewhere quite outside of the technology right. industry, and it's coming into the technology industry with, often with no Rolodex at all, how right. are they going to get to the investors otherwise? And that's exactly. part of the reason why, why we're doing One Million by One Million is to bridge that access gap, and, and we introduce yeah. uh, people to investors left, right, and center because uh, you know, that's what we see all the time is invest, uh, entrepreneurs don't have that access. But, but I think as, a, as an industry phenomenon, your point is very well taken that I think uh, – in not accepting some of these approaches, I think there's a there's a danger that you're losing a lot. But at the same time, you know, if people get so many emails, right? Investors get so many emails. Yeah, and that's why there's no substitute for having some impressive execution. You know, people who have managed to bootstrap their way or minimal investment to get to early evidence of traction. Yeah. And traction speaks for itself. It'll, it'll stand out in an email as opposed to, oh, yeah, I'm just thinking of an idea. 
uh, you know, maybe uh, the people you all work with, if they can figure out a way to cut through the, all the challenges to get some early traction established, that yeah. speaks speak for itself. Yes, and our philosophy completely is bootstrap first, raise money later, and and exactly. that's in response to what the how the industry behaves. The industry likes right. product market fit. That's the bottom line. Yeah. Um, now, what? Uh, it's a slightly different question. Um, you must be seeing thousands of deals a year. If you look at the last eighteen months of your deal flow, what trends are you seeing? What's standing out as what's happening in your geography and in your deal flow? Yeah, it's very consistent, you know, in the sense that, um, you know, we, we, we struggle with completely broad horizontal ideas mm -hmm. um, just because, you know, obviously there are lots and lots and lots of people thinking about broad horizontal ideas um, and so on. So I think uh, a richness of verticalization industry expertise, we see a lot of amazing companies coming out to go tackle specific problems of retail, specific problems of healthcare. Uh, and, and the big question is, can they be big enough niches or not? Uh, mm -hmm. So we, what we look for in those instances is uh, maybe the first problem is a nice beachhead to get started with, but can this entrepreneur dream about a second act here, which there they can parlay their early success into doing something more substantial uh, on an ongoing basis? The, the early foothold they have into the market can then lead into uh, a, a, a larger play further downstream. Uh, that way they don't have to start off by dreaming off this incredibly large horizontal play with a giant opportunity, mm -hmm. but make it a one-two punch to go from a first play to something much bigger. So I think that's yeah. a common uh, entrepreneurs here are getting savvy about thinking about that. How do you get to a first beachhead? And how do you then, you know, maybe it's a B2B2C to B to play where you go and crack into a B2B angle here initially and use that relationship, that network to go and build a B2C opportunity subsequent to that. Uh, yeah. and that way you go from a first dependable, repeatable, predictable source of revenue from a B2B play and you build a network out of that and then go to an interesting marketplace or a transaction model to consumers subsequently. I think that's mm -hmm. a, definitely a common theme we are seeing, especially in somewhat more capital-constrained markets, like in Austin, uh, where there's plenty of ideas, plenty of high-quality ideas coming through. So industry meets B2B2C is definitely popular. Um, we continue to see a steady stream of uh, exciting innovation in the infrastructure software space. Maybe we might see, uh, say, blockchainizing enterprise. What are the challenges associated with that? Maybe mm -hmm. you know, everything from compliance, AML, do uh, how do you manage distributed apps and how do you take traditional enterprise expertise to go tackle those kinds of problems? Um, what are security implications for things like that? So we are seeing a variety of different evolution of uh, infrastructure, software type of plays across the spectrum. I would say those would be the two broad areas, which again leverages what are tremendous strength of this market uh, coupled with uh, the, the, the infusion of technology to go tackle these things. And the infrastructure uh, deal flow, would you credit that to the presence of IBM and Tivoli and all that? That's, it seems like probably there are a lot of entrepreneurs who grew up through those systems, yeah? Right. That's an ecosystem about now almost you know, 25 years old. Tivoli got started in the 90s. So yeah, but when if I came out of that and, and all that, right? True, true, true. That beget a lot of other interesting companies out of that, right? And so you yeah. got you know, solar winds in town, which went public. You got sale point that went public here. Uh, you got a lot of companies of that ilk here, and a lot of, uh, uh, you know, Cisco's got a big presence. You just got a lot of, you know, IBM, of course, yeah. companies have a big presence. A lot of big companies, a lot of exciting startups that have come out of that. We got an exciting company called NSS Labs, which is the, uh, the standard for cyber security, um, you know, call, they almost call it consumer reports meet cybersecurity in some sense uh, mm -hmm. here in the portfolio, uh, just drawing up, up on um, a good talent that comes out of, say, Symantec here in town, Blue Code in town. So lots mm -hmm. of good talent in cyber infrastructure software, computer networking, and of course, Dell's got a giant presence with a big enterprise presence here in this market. So those would be some of the areas where we continue to have a lot of talent. And um, what 
are your thoughts and the geography's thought about unicorns? Of course, in Silicon Valley, most VCs are chasing unicorns. How do you think about it? You know, I think we, if we, you know, end up with a unicorn, which are, of course, not as rare as they used to be, it's wonderful. But I think, you know, we balance uh, the combination of, as opposed to pursuing a badge called unicorn, I think we balance um, capital efficiency with uh, getting to exciting outcomes. You know, if the company has to raise $300 million to get to a billion dollar valuation, um, you know, that's got implications for earlier stage investors, the founders yeah. themselves. Um, there might be a structured return that's built into it to make it attractive for people to come in at a unicorn valuation. I think, you know, if, if you can get, be in an instance where companies are capital efficient, let's say you can, they raise 20 to $40 million, let's say, and they can get to a $250 million outcome, um, people might do even much better uh, yes, in that instance exactly. compared to being in a unicorn status as opposed to pursuing that as a badge. So what we look for fundamentally are businesses that can, you know, where we invest in them are sub million dollar run rate businesses, but can they get to be, say, at $50 million plus in revenues in five to seven years, get to that uh, in, in, with, with some prudent um, uh, investment, not, not go crazy, and you can always buy your way to big revenues. Can you mm-hmm. grow in a capital efficient fashion to get to that sort of revenue scale where you raise something less than $50 million, maybe it's you know, 30 to 40 or 50 maybe, but get to that kind of scale over that period, uh, you know, good things naturally happen to those companies. You know, those companies can continue to grow, yeah. be unicorns, those companies can be even acquired at $250, 300 million and, um, you know, you can build a phenomenal venture portfolio, and, and, and founders can be, you know, phenomenally wealthy yeah. doing that yeah. is what's possible. Of course, if things come to break out and they attract uh, Urus of outside capital at rich but don't have to depend or bet on that phenomena to go build an amazing venture portfolio is what we think about. Yeah, and, and I think your fund size is, is at the right size to do all that. If your right. fund size is too large, then you, then you don't have the luxury of doing what you're talking exactly. about. And I, I actually exactly. think that uh, your fund size is, is, a better suited, is much better suited to venture investing than Right. These like billion dollar funds that try to do venture investing. That's right. Okay, well, <laughs> last question. Do you have companies in your 30 portfolio companies? Do you have companies that are, um, uh, you know, above, let's say, $5 million? And those we would like to actually cover in our, you probably know our blog, we've covered these entrepreneur journey stories and thought leadership stories and so forth. So send them to us and, and we will. Uh, you know, do those very deep case study based stories on them. That would be great. You know, there are a whole bunch of them, you know, like for somebody who might uh, uh, think about it, you know, CS Disco is a great story. There's yeah. something called Ojo Labs, that's a great story in AI based chat for real estate. The digital pharmacists um, are all, and we just recently sold an amazing company called Opsity to News Corp, which went from two years from a seed stage investment of ours to being a material double-digit revenue business, and we sold it News Corp for $210 million mm-hmm. last month. So there are a lot of amazing stories like that. Happy to uh, yeah. connect uh, yeah. you or Maureen to any of those to do profiles on that. Great. We have a colleague called Sheldon who will follow up on this. That's perfect. All right. Well, Krishna, that was splendid, and we got a great view into what's happening in Texas. I, uh, you know, my first summer job was in Texas at Texas Instruments in Dallas in 1990, so I know got the it. area well. Um, thank you for coming. Things have changed and, a bit uh, since then. What was that? Things have changed a bit since then. I'm sure. Yes, I'm <laughs> sure. Yes. <laughs> Well, nice to meet you, Krishna, and we'll keep in touch and and, uh, cover more of your companies. That sounds good. Really enjoyed it, Shramana. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Folks, we are going to switch to the entrepreneur pitch session. We have three scheduled pitches, and then depending on how much time we have, we'll take questions from and even pitches from the audience. 
Um, just wanting to know one thing. This is a working session. This is a safe working session. You don't need to be nervous. You don't need to be defensive. Just, you know, discuss what is it that you need help with, what are you struggling with, and we'll just try to brainstorm our way through how to deal with those situations or those issues. Now, you may disagree with my feedback. That's okay. It's your venture. The strategy that you're going to follow is your strategy. So take the feedback and see how that feels to you, what you want to do, what changes you want to make in your strategy. Uh, one thing you do need to remember is not all businesses can raise money, not all businesses should raise money, and raising money doesn't necessarily guarantee success. The market is full of debt buy over funding stories and, and so on and so forth, but at the same time, you know, a lot of companies in our uh, universe do raise money, and we know pretty much all about what it takes to raise money. Let us start with uh, Chandrasekhar from Bangalore. Would you unmute your line, Chandrasekhar? Mm -hmm. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi. Hi, Samana. And Hello. Uh, everyone uh, hearing me. Can you see me? Yes, we can. No, we can't see oh. you. We can hear you. Oh, okay, that's, that's okay. fine. No worries. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Uh, okay, I'm uh, Shekhar uh, for short. And uh, should I go ahead and then uh, tell you about go myself? Go ahead with your presentation. Just let me know when you want me to advance your slides. Right. Okay. Uh, now, uh, I listened to your uh, talk a few days back, Sumana, and uh, when you said that uh, you better get bootstrapped and then you are in a better position to raise funds, uh, yes. broadly on those lines. And uh, that's what we have been doing. Our plan A was to bootstrap and succeed. And plan okay. B was if funding comes along the way, fine, fair enough. It's good, but uh, we will not stop for anything. Okay. So this is, uh, it's been eight years in this company, Alpha Mars, this is founded by me. Uh, I was mm -hmm. a ship captain earlier for many years, so two decades and a few years in Singapore doing some risk management uh, in an oil tanker company. I just got bored of the job and threw uh, away everything, came back, uh, did finance management in Singapore, and uh, I am Bangalore executive management here, and uh, got started with this. So uh, we did a uh, few things, varied things like environment assessments and oil spill response services. Uh, they are they're regular, there are many people doing that. We were also one of them doing that. And last couple of years back, we got into innovation. Uh, we saw opportunities for innovation around us, simple, low cost, common sense solutions. So uh, that's uh, our story. Uh, so uh, we uh, have a few such innovations, and one of them is we developed a wave energy uh, harnessing seabed based model. Uh, of course, we are not going to commercialize that. We are making a floating version of the same thing, and then we will commercialize it. We also have a plan to do, have a small unmanned, small payload, wave-powered boat for a lot of applications. Hmm. So uh, we want to bring these three activities of ocean wave energy into one startup at some point of time. Since I'm the founder member of the company, and uh, I, we can restructure that. That's a minor detail. But these are the technologies so, that we're talking about. What, what does the eight-year-old profit-making company do? What, what is the business? Where does the revenue come from? Right. Okay, initial three, four years, we have been giving regular services, oil spill response and those kind of things. And we put money on the table with that. And now our innovations... Uh, river cleanup solution, low cost river cleanup solution, those things have started bringing in revenue. Two of our products are commercialized and they have started bringing in the revenues. And we are also getting support uh, from a PSU company for uh, one more of our uh, design development activity for robotic hydrocarbon oil tank cleaning. So uh, uh, let me put it like this, a slightly confusing picture, so I'll put it simply, we are developing technology and now the commercialization has started. The revenues are coming from these. And we are focusing on developing technologies. And 
we are providing some services to prove these technologies. But we, where we want to go in the next couple of years is get known for the technologies that we are developing so that we could sell the technology as such to people when they know the technology that we are developing is very useful. So uh, there's, okay. there's a bunch of things that you're going to need to learn, first and foremost, is that investors, if you're talking about raising money, investors don't fund this kind of portfolio of technologies. Investors will take one product that has high market potential and high velocity growth and growth potential and see if they want to invest in that business or not. If you go around making five different types of technologies and each has a little modest bit of success, that is not the kind of company investors fund. Yes, uh, I have not uh, structured my company towards investment. Let me be very honest. When we uh, develop these new products, get our traction, generate these revenues, and we have got some five to six different products, and three of them are already commercialized. We are uh, flowing a little bit like as the water takes us. At the same time, we are succeeding in putting these uh, innovations in the table. One of them is a river cleanup that has succeeded in stopping a million pounds of trash from going into the sea. So I do not think many of the um, investors would be really connecting to me because uh, I have seen their approach. It's a little different. They have their own focus on the money, the numbers, and things like that. What we are putting on the table is certain value, which uh, not an investor will have the patience to sit you and listen or to, be convinced about. You don't have to raise money. You can continue to do it. If your passion is to innovate on new products and solving new problems, and as long as you get a few customers from each of those products and uh, businesses, that's, and, and as long as there is ROI for the investment that you put into building those products, as long as there is you know, revenue-based ROI, there's nothing stopping you from doing that. Exactly. There's nothing stopping us, and we'll perhaps put many such products on the table, and we do not have a great appetite for competition, to be very honest. We are not a very marketing-oriented. We have done all this with about less than 10 people with very small uh, amount of funds, and we have got a lot of media attention, and uh, we have the PSC oil companies giving us funds for further studies uh, in uh, robotic tank cleaning. We are talking of millions of dollars of uh, market potential from these products. When I say river cleanup, we have the, probably one of the very few working uh, products for cleaning up a river. Uh, it is uh, in Chennai, uh, as I said, it's uh, over one million pounds of trash has been stopped. This is only proven product. Uh, and uh, including this, uh, there is a group which is cleaning up a great Pacific patch. Uh, somebody from their office also touched with us. And uh, uh, so what we are doing has got a very big impact. Uh, the tank cleaning that I'm talking about, each uh, single unit of that sells for three million pounds. And we are getting funds, and in a year's time, we should be putting that on the table. So uh, what I'm saying is, no, we are not really tailored for an investor interest because it's a little confusing picture, and he may not want to get into a lot of these details. So what no, we are doing is... I see on your challenge, you say need investors who share the vision and there is no quick return. There is no such investor. That is, that is a friend, friends and family investor. If you want that kind of investor, go find in your friends and family. So, don't, so take the investment uh, option off the table and figure out what is the best strategy of building your company without investment because you don't have an option for investment. Given the structure of the company that you're building and the strategy that you want to follow, this is not a fundable company. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. We, will, uh, we have been going on so far, and uh, every day is getting better because uh, we are getting calls from various uh, corners of the country for uh, our products and so uh, uh, working what can, you, what can we do for you? This is, by the way, we are... Our accelerator is an IT and IT-enabled services accelerator. We are not the best place for what you're doing either in terms of – I think river cleanup is a wonderful thing. I was in – this August, I was in Varanasi, and, uh, and I believe Varanasi is actually Modi's constituency, and they're really trying to clean up the river, and so far the river is a mess. 
So I'm sure if you if you if they knew about your solution and and if you started dialoguing with them, that is a river that needs to be cleaned. The Ganges is very dirty, and I'm originally from Calcutta, also dirty Ganges there. So um, so I'm sure there are lots of opportunities. This is not our specialization. Our specialization is the IT world. I realize that, and uh, it's just that what you said last time that bootstrap uh, uh, go on create value. We are just doing that. Something yeah, resonated perfect. with me and thought perfect. I should speak to you. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, so keep going. Yeah. Keep the most important thing that you need to do, and and this is one thing I will tell you, and this applies whether you're doing IT or anything, any field, any domain. The one thing you have to keep in mind is that if you put investment into building a product, you have to make money of that product. You have to have customers, and you have to have revenues, and you have to have profits. So before venturing into a product, a solution, involve customers early on so that you have their input, their validation, and so forth, and then go sell to those customers and, and monetize. So there should, even if it's, if you're not doing, you know, a $100 million business that is a venture capital style business, if you put in $10,000 into developing a product, you should try to make $100,000 in revenue. If you put $100,000 in a product, you should try to make a million dollars in revenue, at least. And you should possibly do a lot more than that. But all I'm saying is do not do businesses at a loss. Do not just do science projects. That's not the way to run a business. And no, I agree with you. Absolutely cannot do that. No, I, I fully agree with you. I cannot afford to create a loss because right. whatever we have done in the last couple of years is from our own accruals and surpluses. That we haven't taken money from anyone. You see the media coverage on the slide, if you see the kind of media exposure we have got, that is a pointer to the impact we have on a society, not in terms of dollars and things like that. Uh, I mean, it's too early to say those things. But each of these products have made money, and our strategy has been a very tight cost control. So the, uh, the return has, uh, the, uh, it is de-risked quite often, this, uh, our investment, and the returns are pretty good as and when it happens. There's a certain time scale, we can't wait for it. So we are going on firing on different barrels for this. Terrific. So good luck, uh, keep going, and keep maintaining the discipline of customers, revenues, and profits, and you have a, you have a sustainable business. Thank you, Sumana. You're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, Johanna, you are up next. Yes, Sumana, good morning. Good morning. Are you calling from Colombia? Yes. Do you know Colombia or awesome. South America? Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. A partner that is Luis. Luis yeah, are uh, you there? yeah uh, right now we are here, Joana Linares. Um, beside to me is Oscar Carasquilla. We are not so fluent in English, so... I apologize in advance, and uh, I ask you please uh, if you talk slowly. <laughs> For us, it could be very, very nice. I'm not sure if Luis Aguas is connected too, because uh, he's right now in, in Orlando, United States. Luis, can you hear okay. me? No. Okay, I think he's, he's not uh, connected. So well, Joanna, if he's connected say... on the call, uh, on the WebEx, he should be able to hear you. Um, and, and by I the way, you will have... Can you, hear me? you will have a recording available of the call, so you can share it with the rest of your team as well after this session. Okay, okay I think he's, so go he's, ahead. he's all right. Okay, thank you, Romana, and thank you uh, for, for this free roundtable session because it's very important important for us. Uh, we are Bancalimentos. Bancalimentos is a, a social business model created and founded three years ago. Uh, in fact, you are seeing in the, in the, in the actual slide the main uh, founder board right now. The first founder and the president is Olga Bocarejo, is the first person at the top of the, of the slide, and she's a rural woman. And this is a process uh, that benefits to rural people in Colombia, and we are expecting uh, the result of the board team. Uh, we are expecting to replicate this model uh, all over Colombia and all over Latin America. Uh, okay. 
Okay. Uh, our value proposition is that uh, it's very simple. It's store trash into money for rural people. And this is working, as I said, uh, three years ago. Uh, our name, Bank Alimentos, uh, is the union of two words. It's bank plus food. That is giving food, medicine, and uh, insurance benefits to rural people who are not uh, financial included, who are um, um, very poor, and they have very, very difficult to get balanced food even in their own village in our country. In fact, uh, uh, Mrs. Olga Bocarejo is, uh, has been a witness of uh, sad cases of uh, people who commit suicide uh, about these kind of situations. And our models try to solve the environmental problem and the social problem of garbage and poor nutrition of rural families in very, very poor rural areas in, in Colombia and later in Latin America. Um, uh, you know, are, are some common facts uh, related to this, this uh, process is uh, rural people is not uh, accustomed to recycling uh, trash. Mm -hmm. Um, the system is encouraging people to change habits uh, about the waste disposal in rural communities yeah. and uh, change this kind of disposal for money. This money is represented by food, represented by medicines, and uh, represented mm -hmm. by uh, one insurance, uh, supported by uh, one big uh, company here in Colombia, giving mm -hmm. some money and some kind of benefits to unemployment people, um, pregnancy uh, women, and children in their poor families. So, yeah, people, this is the, the, the process model right now. People recycle it at the source. Uh, they classify with the material. They receive some kind of uh, uh, learning about how recycle at the first time. They, they approach to the uh, attention points and they receive some kind of uh, classes about recycling. Then they go to the, the, the house, the home, and get the, the trash and uh, go, give, to the go to the bank and give the trash to the, to the people's service. And they put in their uh, paper card how is the amount of points that the system gives them. And they can uh, change by food, medicine, and, and insurance. They can convert this in savings, uh, credits. Um, agricultural assets and so like that. Mr. Roman, this is a, those are real photos of our process, yes, because right now we are running our business in around three years, okay? Yes, so, right now so we have three pension points in rural village. How many villages um, do you have this going in? Okay, right now we have in the system 5,000 uh, people in the system. At the first two years uh, since uh, uh, 2015, we reached uh, 3,000 uh, from 22 uh, people at the first day of the, of the uh, we opened the doors. And two years after, we have 3,000 people. It's, it's very, very, very important. But about the village, uh, we opened eight, uh, so far close, but the first five is we need to close because we have some train nets here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in rural areas, this kind of model business are under some very hazard mm -hmm. uh, and dangers because we know we have a lot of pressure from many actors here. Yeah, local suppliers. Hard. So these, local suppliers, the five thousand that yes. are currently live, how many villages does that represent? Yeah, three, three villages are, are yes. Three, three, three? points. Uh, yeah, we, we are okay. to work And what does it? Yeah. What does it involve when you have to get a village equipped to do this? What are the pieces that you need to have in place to be able to run this operation? Okay. So at first place, we need a local, uh, and this local a place. Uh, sorry, yeah, place. That yeah, here. Open local store near marketplace. Usually, it's pretty clear in front of marketplace. Those those uh, stores or local are very cheap because it's in a small village. Uh, it's managed by by rural family at its own business. They have a unified operation, so all of them uh, share the same software. Uh, for example, I am putting some example here. One a small village that is named Fomeke. Uh, the city produces around. Uh, 12 tonnelets of waste per month, 
After mm -hmm. three months of operation, we managed and recycled three, uh, three point eight, eight tonnage average. And right now, this is a good news for us and good news for people, but it's not very good for the the government and and another guys that have interest in to manage uh, the, those disposal and waste. Uh, so for this reason, we have some some kind of resistance. It's not for the people. The people is pretty happy with the model, but we have some kind of resistance for for, for the guys to manage all this kind of budget. And it, it's a complex situation. For this reason, we have right now uh, three points in in some area pretty near to the capital city, and now it's working because it's, it's more near to the capital city. Uh, so we must be more stronger to start to grow up in in, in a more um, separate area or, or, or remote area. Yes. Uh, the 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 local investment for creating new. I'm sorry, Ms. Ramana. We are not. Hang on a second. There's a big noise here. I need to do something about it. Just a second. Oh, I'm sorry. We are not hearing properly. Yet. Luis, are you there? Luis, Luis Aguas, are you there? Can you hear me? Sorry, folks. There was a no, big okay. disruption noise, and I had to stop them for from doing that so we could continue. All right. So I understand what you're saying. Now it sounds like the there is a tension between what you are doing and the local governments and the people who are in the trash collection business. Is that correct? Yeah, it's it's correct. It's it's, it's not the uh, precisely no, with government. Even the government, uh, major mayors and and govern and public people are, are very happy with this system. In fact, uh, several slides ahead, you can see uh, we have been awarded with uh, with local and international institutions. It's mostly with local suppliers. Uh, I mean, local stores, which see Bank Alimento some kind of competitor about the 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 the, the sales of the products and. Uh, in fact, uh, we have some challenges about not, not only this kind of competition and, and the, the, the way of they are being this kind of opportunity for, for rural community, uh, but it's uh, too about managing the money because we, this is uh, 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 right now a business of cash because we have to uh, uh, receive some kind of uh, money and uh, transfer with money. So, and here in Colombia, that is very dangerous and is uh, expensive if you put that money in the system. So, we are thinking right now with uh, increase this, this, this model with uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, this is one of our ideas, in fact, to, to put a, a virtual uh, currency to, to uh, uh, make How the How do you make money? What is your business model? Oh, yeah, yeah, our business model is very easy. We just uh, get the the waste, and and this is this is, is we have a a very nice agreement because this is a social business, and we have the the perfect uh, agreement. And they um, pay money for this kind of um, you know uh, plastic, um, I don't know, metal um, packaging. Packaging. You, sell, you take the trash and you sell it to people who buy those materials. Yes, but most important that only buy some food. This is more more regular. We we create those kind of products. For example. You have the slide, a perfect slide of one of product with a lot of engagement in our product that, that is very good. That is, yeah, look, they, after open the bank account, they get their loyalty card and they are able to only carry $6 of weight of even organic, even organic because we also are able to found some kind of tomatoes, onions or something like that, so only $6. Uh, you can apply to an insurance that is uh, supported by our government 
that if you suffer some illness or you are sick, it, it is able to pay around $3. $3 per day that you are illness. This is for rural people. It's not possible at all. You don't have any bank account. You don't have any insurance. It's not possible. Only with Bacalimentos, you are totally possible to do that. So people, in fact, we are not expecting to, to give money. In fact, we don't want it because, you know, maybe this money is not used for security, um, food security or this kind of things or nutrition. It can be don't buy by our other use. So for the reason we are so specific to manage our insurance or for the, the teenagers and juniors, we dispose is the lunch box. We don't pay them in, in okay. money. We so yeah. it, let uh, me let me stop okay. you. I think I, I kind of understand your business. Let me go yeah. to your question. First of all, I'll caveat everything by saying that our business is a technology and technology enabled service business. So again, you're a bit outside of our core expertise area, but I will give you a few thoughts. You're talking about using cryptocurrencies. I don't think that's a great idea, partly because the, these rural villagers don't really understand cryptocurrency. So they're not gonna be willing to accept cryptocurrencies as their uh, you know, payment. So I kind of like the idea of being able to put payments into the cell phones and, and you know, those kinds of stuff. I think that's, that is how, if you look at the African uh, revolution in mobile payments and, and so forth, that's how it has happened. It's more in mobile payments. Cryptocurrencies, is, I think, is a step beyond that, which I'm not sure if your audience is going to readily accept. Okay. So, um, yes. uh, yes. so that, that may not be the solution. Um, and it, the, the part that I think is a bit complicated, I think, is what, in what you're saying is the first question that I ask you, what do you need in a village to be able to make this system work, right? You need a store, at least one yes. store that is willing to sell these products again, to these villagers against their points, right? Or is right. this a part of right. a, the point that the, the, the cash that you're giving as digital currency to these, uh, to your rural customers in exchange for trash, uh, is this a completely transferable money? Is it, they, can they go to any store and buy what they want to buy? They have to go to a yeah. store, a specific no, store right that accepts this, right? right for this reason, we start to think about cryptocurrency or something like that, that we can try to create some kind of common market with the, to, to exchange to another uh, stores. Because right now, it's not possible. Those points or those uh, exchange is only valid in so bank it's a point. It's a point system. It's a coupon. It's a cash. It's a point. No, it's not cash, and it's a very important point because, you know, the people that in Colombia works with uh, trash uh, sometimes is not having the best behavior, so exchange uh, trash by money and using the money by drugs or by alcohol. Well, and, and I think trash businesses all over the world have been dominated by the mafia. Exactly. So, exactly. The reason we want to change it and only focus over pregnancy mothers, teenagers, juniors, Elder. and other elders. So these guys are looking specifically for food and nutrition and insurance, not money for drugs or alcohol or something like that. So, so I think my first feedback to you is you need to be very careful because the world that you are playing in is a dangerous world. And you started yes. off by saying some of that, and I, I think this is a messing with these people and their businesses and so forth. You need to be very, very careful. The last thing you want is to end up, you know, poking in a, in a group that is powerful and that is, you know, basically dangerous. You could get killed. So, so I think you should be very careful about your safety. Oh, thank and you. then we, comes we, all this other, yeah? 
Yeah, we, we are very aware of that. In fact, uh, Olga Bocarejo, the main founder, received some threats uh, against her life uh, several years ago. It's, it's very dangerous, you are, you are right. Uh, but we are we are very positive about the the good impact. And what we need to know now is how to uh, make the, the mo this model sustainable uh, in in a financial way, in a in a in a social way. That in order to uh, put more more uh, attention points and uh, in grow this business uh, all over Colombia and, and Latin America because. We are uh, we are testing this system, and this is um, um, good for for the people. And we need to know how with uh, with technical uh, sources and with uh, assessment. It is not it is not even clear to me that you have the business model to be sustainable, because there are too many pieces that are gaps. So first and foremost, you are giving out points, not cash against trash. So I see how you would make money. You would take the trash and sort the trash and sell it to different people. That's how the, there is a trash business model. That part I understand. But you're giving the people who are bringing you the ta trash, you're giving them points. Now those points are only rene redeemable in these little kind of stores, let's say kiosks, where there's a certain supply of material. Now how, what is the business model for that? I mean, if the stores accept those points as payment, how, what is, where is the, how is the store going to buy their inventory? How, how is the store sustainable? The store is not sustainable. There's no business model supporting the store. Your business model is flawed. Well, right, right now we have some experience during, during these three years. The first experience to make more uh, sustainable our business model is because we've uh, asked for Juno's uh, social business. Uh, this organization paid for us a, um, cons a consultant process with Boston Consulting Group, and they, with, with us, um, model uh, a, 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 this business, and they found that it's, it's, it's sustainable if we open a, a small village and around create some kind of adjacent points to get the trash and unify the operation of get the trash and only have a one contract to manage them. And the another so the only way we... this thing becomes sustainable, I think based on what you're telling me, is actually very interesting. The only way this thing is sustainable is if you can collect enough trash and be able to sell that trash at enough money and make enough money to be able to buy the inventory of the store and still keep a profit. Yeah, and and, it, and it's and it's real, uh, Romana, because if I can give you some some numbers, for example, for 2016, this uh, business have revenues for three hundred thousand okay. dollars, and uh, and gross profits for eighty thousand uh, uh, dollars uh, around. And this is this is this is real. Uh, in fact, it it is uh, uh, um, financial sustainable indeed, but uh, it has high cost of purchasing consumer products. For example, high cost for to buy food, to buy medicine, because uh, we have not uh, the the enough volume and negotiation capacity because we have not enough uh, points. Uh, I mean, uh, attention places. And we have not uh, enough uh, yeah. volume of people. Yeah, for this reason, we are focusing over another products for right now that is insurance that is not necessarily the cost right now. It's only when you sell and it's almost virtual the, the, the insurance and only apply when you for real need to apply. And another thing is it, it, this question that you, you put for uh, in the slide is it desirable to sell third party products? Or is better wild label products in our store because maybe we are a start Yeah, but it costs a lot of money to white label products. You're not there yet to be able to do any of that. So right now you're going to have to work with third party products and, and maybe go talk to some of the consumer product companies and their uh, CSR, you know, corporate social responsibility group. So if, you know, maybe Procter & Gamble or Unilever, you talk to their corporate social responsibility groups. And, and see if they're willing to do something with you so that you can get the inventory at a reasonable cost and, and then make your business work. So I think it's a matter of getting reasonable supply, reasonably priced supplies, and being able to 
sell enough trash to be able to cover those costs. That's really your business. So, yes, um, yes, so I think the only, only thing I can see there from an optimization point of view is if you can convince the suppliers of the consumer products to sell you products at a you know, decent price. And, and that's, for that, you're going to need to talk to the corporate social responsibility groups and explain what you're doing. And if you have enough of those relationships, this would be very good for them to, to work with you in that mode. So that's my next, from this call, that is your takeaway, is go talk to Procter & Gamble or Unilever, whoever is the main supplier of consumer products for, your, for the kinds of villages that you're working on, and, and go talk to their corporate social responsibility groups. Okay. Thank you, so Thank you Romana. And it's You're for the last question, in your opinion, what will be our next step for, for, this, for this process, in your opinion? Uh, I think your next step is that, is to convince corporations to back you, to support you with good inventory at a decent price. Because if you can get that, a steady supply of inventory that is redeemable with those points, that you are giving out to your villages, that's, I think that kind of closes the loop. You have, a, you have a way of taking the trash and selling the trash and monetizing that, and you have a way of buying inventory with that money, but you have to do that in a, the equation, you're saying that you've already made that equation work, you're making more money off the trash than you are buying inventory with. So, uh, so I think that's, that's good. You just need a reliable supply of inventory is what you're telling me. So if you can close that gap, I think you have a full circuit that works. But again, I have to say what scares the hell out of me is the danger of what you're doing. So be very careful. Thank you, Zamana. Okay, Thank you. Zermana. All the best. Thank you. We All appreciate that. Okay. We have one more presenter here. Uh, Safa Swayet from Sierra Leone. Safa, are you on the call? Uh, yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Huh? Go ahead, Safa. Please yeah, go ahead. Okay. The company is Urang. Yes, yes. Uh, the name of the company is Urang. Uh, I am Pa. Next slide, please. Um, and what do you do? What does, what does Urang do? The project is basically an attempt to... Uh, uh, this is the part of what's coming. Keep it. Uh, let's stick to this a, bit, a little bit. We're a cloud-based company to machine learning and artificial intelligence to provide uh, management and accounting solution to businesses initially. But the general idea that uh, strategy, we are also taking every business, uh, plug in their uh, customers and plug in all their employees into the network. The employees, of course, will represent the end user consumer sector. And trying to create an actual uh, network uh, the, with the objective of uh, uh, of uh, shifting the economy from uh, cashless to cashless, creating a foundation and network for that. What we're using initially, we're starting with a few companies and using all their uh, customers and again all their employees and plugging them into the network in order to be able to have a prototype. Once we have that prototype, we plug in a mobile money aspect uh, in order to create, as you see in this Do you slide, have customers cash. right now? Are you doing it with somebody? I'm have you started some, doing yes, this yes, with yes, a customer? Yes, yes. One of the slides is going to show, uh, in a little bit, is going to show us uh, what we have. Yes, we have five main companies, which we call premiums. And then we have premiums, which is their customers, meaning that okay. we have certain uh, services that are free, uh, just to plug everybody to create the interest to be in the network. However, uh, uh, we do have uh, we do charge when they uh, 
see the meaning. Uh, uh, so uh, we will get to that in the in, the, in, the, in an upcoming slide. But this slide here tells you that we're starting with about uh, five to ten companies. Uh, I just mentioned now, and uh, and are they paying uh, you these five to ten companies? Are they paying you? Well, initially, right now, thing, uh, Bootstrap is the three minimum viable products, and we expect to start uh, making generating income from uh, both of January, upcoming January when we finish uh, the the mobile app version. We have right now this app. Uh, it's being used by the companies, and, uh, uh, and at this point, uh, not, not enough to cover the expenses. I should say yes, enough to cover only the expenses. However, we are you doing the software uh, development yourself? Uh, pretty much yes. I'm a software developer. Okay. Uh, we're using uh, yes. Again, so uh, you have you are doing the software yourself. You have an MVP that is coming up, and from January onwards, this five to ten med small medium companies in Sierra Leone are going to start using that software and start paying you for it. Yes. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, is that correct? Uh, we we know how it, that's correct, and that's the field sales module. We have it now the web based. Uh, once we finish with the Android uh, model, I don't want to yet to monetize it because I think the market for it is, uh, is, is very uh, is there the demand for such whereby the salespeople go to the field, they sell using the tablet uh, offline, and be, uh, the sales orders to the uh, dispatch uh, locations and uh, the we believe will um, uh, again if it's that uh, chart uh, you want to set um, state, uh, so what do you need help with it, uh, it seems very straightforward to me you have a product that you have in mind you have a minimum viable product that you have you have basically concept sold to about five um, companies you're going to fulfill those in January, and you're going to start selling, and they're going to start paying you. Is so. Tell me where you are. Where are you stuck? Oh, we're not uh, really stuck. I think we are going uh, in the right direction, uh, fulfilling our uh, our expectations at this moment in time. However, uh, we finish with the prototype. Uh, we hope to expand throughout uh, Sierra Leone. And what we okay. need at that moment in time is uh, advice on which companies on how to do the monetize, the, 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 the mobile pay aspect of it. That's really because I'm thinking that it would require uh, expertise that uh, uh, to recruit some of that uh, or a group to control the mobile aspect of operation once we apply it throughout Sierra Leone, after we, do, we finish with the prototype. And from there, we anticipate to go to different uh, neighboring countries that do have a so similar need of... You have, a long way to, you have a long way before you're going to go to neighboring countries and all that. Just take it one step at a time. Try to yes. get 100 small, medium businesses in Sierra Leone using your product, using your minimum viable product, or you know, advanced versions of that, and start paying you. The first step right now, the first thing you need to do is generate paying customers who are comfortable with the features and functions that you're providing in the product. That is the absolute first and most important step that you need to cross at the moment. Nothing yeah, else matters at the moment. You have all these other fantasies of you're gonna do this and that and other things, Stay focused on your immediate target, which is you need to get 100 customers, 100 paying customers for a product. And, and in that process, if you stay focused on that agenda, in that process you will learn. If you listen to your customers, you will learn what features and functions are they looking for in that product, what are they willing to pay for. That's the only thing you should work on for the next six months. That's the only thing you should work on. Okay. 
Okay. I understand what you agree. Yes. All right. Great. Um, Good. All right. I don't have any other questions. Uh, pretty much clear to me, and uh, I do four times read uh, on some of the videos. Um, you have other questions? You. No, no questions right now. Not right no now. That's fine. So you, you're welcome to come back and, and uh, dialogue in the round tables. And if you just hang on, I will explain a bit later. In just now, actually, I will explain how to use the program to learn you know, all the things that you need to learn in building a business. So just hang on, and you can ask questions after that if you like, also. Okay. Right. What uh, I love uh, about this uh, today's session is that it's almost like a United Nations conference, right? It's, we have uh, India, Colombia, Sierra Leone. I think it's a very unusual session where we have that many, um, you know, kind of underdeveloped geographies. And I'm, I'm always thrilled to see entrepreneurs doing interesting, exciting, meaningful stuff in you know, different parts of the world. So congratulations, and I'm very happy that uh, that you are doing that and making progress. In the case of uh, Johanna and the, um, the Colombian venture, you're already making revenues and profits. That's, you know, kind of half the battle is right there. You know, half the battle is won right there in, a, in the fact that you're able to do that. So very good. It's excellent that you're able to do that. So if you like what we're doing in the program, please bring serious entrepreneurs into 1M by 1M. Your fellow entrepreneurs, your friends, families, peer groups, whoever is doing a venture and needs help, bring them into 1M by 1M and, and have them use the resources that we've put together. So everything is at 1M by 1M.com. You'll find a, a blog that, is, that you can follow for free from anywhere in the world. The Entrepreneur Journeys book series is a series of 12 books, and those are uh, double-click down on a particular topic. That could be bootstrapping with a paycheck. It could be positioning. It could be women entrepreneurs. There are various volumes, and these are all case study-based books. Um, then these roundtables, these free roundtables, happen every week almost. So come to these roundtables. Just by coming to the roundtables, following the roundtables, you'll, you'll learn a lot. Um, this is a, the, the full acceleration program from 1M by 1M is 1M by 1M Premium. And there we offer you extensive methodology guidance, a full online curriculum. We help you with business development. Um, our, we have a very, very powerful Rolodex, and that Rolodex is available to you as part of the premium program. We help you with strategy consulting. We have premium roundtables, private roundtables like this, same format, but they are private members-only roundtables where we do the strategy consulting, the coaching, mentoring, whatever you call it. We have a terrific network of investors that we work with. Um, they, uh, you know, they look at our deals from our portfolio, but you have to be fundable before we're going to send you to them. So there's a long journey into... Um, the, process, the path of getting to investors because you have to have a bunch of collaterals and you have to have – your strategy has to be fundable. Your business has to be fundable. And there's a whole you know, tutorial in the curriculum on, on the financing aspect of businesses that you need to learn to understand what is fundable, what is not fundable. And, and if you more or less follow the curriculum, you will know yourself whether your business is fundable or not and will help you figure that out. And if you are, and if you're ready to be introduced, we can introduce you to lots of investors. Like in one afternoon, you could get invest in, uh, introduced to 50 investors that fit your profile. So there's, you know, there's a lot of leverage in the program, like we were talking about earlier with Krishna, that you know, investors like to have referrals coming from people they know. So that is a part of the dynamic of our industry. So go dig around on the website. 1M by 1M self-assessment is a set of questions that you should ask yourself. These are questions that investors would ask you. We prefer that you ask these questions of yourself. 1M by 1M basic is our curriculum only option. That is $99 a month. 
just by doing the curriculum, no matter where you are, if you do this curriculum, you'll learn a lot. And this is kind of like a mini MBA. And, um, and we recommend that if you are doing this as the first time, as a first time entrepreneur, study the curriculum and you will bridge a lot of gaps in your knowledge. So go to Garon on the website. There's lots of information about premium, about basic FAQs, video FAQs, description of the curriculum. This is a case study based program. We have hundreds of successful entrepreneurs. I think it's approaching 900 successful entrepreneur case studies at this point. We have video lectures, interviews, video interviews. And, and that's how you learn. You learn by, from other people who have done it before successfully. The methodology, as I said, is lean, capital efficient, bootstrap startups, bootstrap first, raise money later is the mantra. And uh, that's it. We have two free roundtables left this year. One is November 20th, one is December 18th, and partly because I'm traveling uh, from right after Thanksgiving until mid-December. Um, and we also have two in-person rendezvous in Silicon Valley at Cafe Boroni uh, in Menlo Park. We, this is just five minutes away from Stanford University and five minutes away from San, Sand Hill Road, the VC headquarter of Silicon Valley. Uh, one is Wednesday, November 20th at 6.30 p.m. Pacific time, and the other is Wednesday, November 19th. Uh, oh, uh, Maureen, it is not Wednesday, November 20th. It's Tuesday, November 20th, I think. You keep making this mistake. Um, the other one is Wednesday, November, uh, December 19th at 5 p.m. PDT. Both are at Cafe Boroni. So sorry for the error, I think. Uh... So if you're visiting Silicon Valley or you're planning to visit Silicon Valley, keep an eye on the rendezvous schedule on the website. And we always publish our rendezvous. And normally, there are two rendezvous a month. So this month, we already had one earlier in November, and we have one more left. In December, we'll have one because of the holidays and so forth. But January onwards, again, you'll have two roundtables usually per month. And, um, and that's it. So um, <laughs> Maureen says she knew that there was a small correction she needed to make. Yes, I know. It's OK. Um, so, but, the, but the November 20th date is correct. OK. Um, if you want to call in and ask questions, if you want to ask in public chat, please feel free. The number is on your screen, 650-479-3208, access code 666-276-078. Let me also introduce you to Irina Patterson. Uh, you can contact uh, Irina at uh, 1mby1m.com to ask any uh, questions you wish about the program. That's it. Um, do you have a question? This is uh, Safa. Yes, Safa. Yes, this is Safa. I have a question or maybe input on uh, how far you think cryptocurrency has gone in Africa as an application. Is it still far-fetched? Should, should it be part of a uh, uh, This is a question, towards this is a question that you should not be asking me. You should go talk to your customers. Our philosophy of customer validation is to work, immerse yourself in customers. So what solution you're trying to build, you should pitch that solution to the prospects, the small businesses in Sierra Leone, and see what they want and what are their needs. Designing products in vacuum is just not what we recommend. You have to design products in collaboration with your customers, understanding what their needs are and fulfilling their needs. That is the only way you can build products that are going to sell, that are going to achieve product market fit. OK? Beautiful. All right. That's a good answer. And Thank in fact, it is beautiful. You know, it's like, it's a bit like magic. Show. If you talk to the right people, you get the right specs. They will tell you what their problems are. And if you listen carefully and if you build products to address and to solve the problems that they are talking about, they will buy your product. This is the whole philosophy. It's very simple. And it just requires a very diligent, very focused execution of talking to customers religiously. Okay. Okay, the line was uh, bad. Now, how soon we get the, uh, the copies of this uh... The, the recording? Table today for sure. 
recording. The recording will be available tomorrow. You will get an email okay. from Maureen with the recording on, on, on YouTube. Okay, great, great. Thank you very much again for the effort. You're for very the, welcome, uh, Tafa. I'm very happy that you came. It's a wonderful group and very motivational, very informative. And I certainly Great. would like to be involved a little bit more, you know, but again, we'll discuss that uh, in a different uh, format. Yeah, if you would like to use the program and join the program, please feel free. And, and, and as you can see, it's a virtual program. So wherever you are in the world, you can access the program. That was the whole, in, in our design, that's what we intended is to make this available to any entrepreneur anywhere in the world. So So please feel free to use it. Tell your friends in Sierra Leone and in Africa about it, and, and uh, whoever wants to use it is very welcome. Well, thank you very much again. Eh? Uh. You're welcome. Okay, folks, any other questions, any other comments? No? All right, then we will wrap up. We'll see you back one more time uh, before Thanksgiving. Um, that's next week. And uh, then we'll, uh, we'll adjourn for a bit and then resume in December. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming today. Bye.